Welcome to Mount Wilson Observatory, 5,700 feet above Los Angeles, and a nice partly cloudy day. We're looking at the 60-inch telescope, one of the historic facilities here used by Edwin Hubble and many others starting more than a century ago. But today we're here to look at a rarely seen solar telescope. Not the one behind me here. Now this one is a 150-foot tower telescope. It's been in use since 1912. And it's still in use today for research uh, and, and has visitors to it on the weekends every uh, day that uh, it's open as well. But today we're going to walk past one of the older facilities and into one that's the oldest one here, something that is rarely seen anymore. And that's the uh, old building here that actually is the, the telescope itself. We'll take a look and, and show it to you a little bit closer here. So now we're, we're approaching the 60-foot solar telescope, which is also a tower telescope. But here you can see a better view of the building itself. This is the back end of the building that will be inside. 60-foot tower here. This was the first telescope of its kind that was made vertically. These telescopes are special designs just for looking at the sun and doing the physics of the sun. So we'll take a little trip past this. This was uh, added on later as a, a dead room, control room. And you can see the structure. These, this was actually made from a, a mail order wind vane uh, tower. You know, there's a windmill on the top of it. But it was put here to try this experimental new kind of a telescope. And as we get past that, Let's duck under the ladder here. And we're starting to approach the entrance to the Snow Solar Telescope. This facility is shuttered most of the time. It's not open for public tours. We do use it for uh, some educational programs. And out towards the end, there's an open area there, but it has mirrors on it. We can't see them right from here. But we're going to go inside. We'll be inside the telescope, and we're going to take a look at how this works, both outside, inside, and underground. And here we are inside this unlikely-looking telescope. So let me show you around a little bit here. You can see there's a bright area down at the end. That's where the sun is actually coming in, and we'll go to that in a minute. But the telescope itself, for those of you who are familiar with uh, amateur telescopes or larger ones, the main mirror here behind the craft services screen out of the way is a 24-inch mirror. This acts like a Newtonian telescope that many of us are used to, and then it comes back up to a secondary mirror up above and reflects down to where we have the solar image being formed. And let's see if we can get a, get a good view of that image here. Now this is going to be, I don't know if the cameras will even handle that. We can stop it down some, but these, there is the, the, the image of the sun. We've been having some problems with clouds today. And I'm going to use uh, welder's uh, glasses in order to be able to look at this. And we see we do still have clouds zipping past here. And there is a sunspot just going behind the clouds right there. But we've got one sunspot, so we know uh, that is an image of the sun. We've got, well, there, there it goes. So we've got a natural eclipse here. Clouds have taken over, but they're coming up the mountain. We'll take a look at those two, and uh, you'll be able to see what's happening there. So let's take a look back here at the primary mirror and give everybody a little bit, uh, get their bearings here. So now this actually, this here is a special solar telescope as well. It's not being used right now, but those of you who are familiar with uh, solar observing will recognize the red uh, energy rejection filter on the end. It's a refractor F30. It's designed specifically to use an H-alpha filter. 
but that's something new. Now this telescope and this mirror we're looking at, this is all original, 1904. In fact, the mirror goes back farther, but it was put in place here in 1904 and has been used ever since. This is a 24-inch F30, focal length of 60 feet, and if it doesn't look like an amateur mirror with a curve in it, that's because it is so slow, that is a long focus, that it looks like it's flat. It's hard to see any curve at all. Now you may notice there's dust all over it. All I can say is if you're a nighttime astronomer, don't ever look at your mirror during the daytime because that's what it's going to look like. We always see it because we have sunlight on it. And we also have, you notice how bright the image was there, and if we need to, we can stop it down. Here we just make it smaller so it turns it into about a Oh, eight inch telescope or so, so that we can look at it a little bit easier. But we need all of the light to get into the spectrograph. So this pier here that I'm standing next to that cranks the motors, everything here is original. Rocks in the pier that were brought here from the surrounding area. Now, you can see that the sun is shining in from way down in the end there. That's going to blast the camera out a little bit. But we're going to take a a little look down there and see how we get the light into this telescope. So we have here a horizontal Newtonian type telescope, slightly off axis. So for the people that understand telescopes, that's what it is. But we don't try and point the telescope towards the sun, we bring the sun to the telescope. So let's take a look out here and see how we do that. You can see this nice curve we have in an early spectrograph room. There's a room inside there that the light will go into also. And they just had to keep it out of the way of the light path here coming in. So we're getting a little bit of the fog from down below right now. These two mirrors are what's called the coelostat. There are two mirrors that direct the light into the primary mirror there, so we're seeing the, uh, the image on the telescope. And this out here is how we managed to get that done. Now, I wish we had a little bit more sunlight to show, but this is what we've got right now. And it's been clear here most of the time, so this might drop down. We have a nice, uh, beautiful, foggy day down below. This Earlier this morning, we were looking down on beautiful cloud tops, and that was nice. So the way this works, the sun reflects off of this first mirror. This is flat. Light that reflects off is just the same as any other sunlight. This reflects the light up into the second mirror here. You can see some of the sunlight there, a little weakened by the clouds. And then from here, it goes all the way back down to the primary mirror at the end. And you can see that's brightly lit by the sun right now as well. So this is the mechanism that does it. Now, it's out in the open right now, but right behind us here, what we walk through the tunnel, if we can uh, take a look here at this, this structure. This is a shed that covers these mirrors. It actually rolls up here and covers them all, and then when we roll it back, it covers the light path. So, uh, so it works out perfectly. Now these mirrors here, these flat mirrors, are original again. These were made during the late 19th century, first used at Yerkes Observatory. They are plate glass, and uh, they're very, very thick, so that the sunlight does not cause them to warp too much. And let's see if we can, a little bit unplanned here, if Somebody can get it at the back of this. I'm making the cameraman do calisthenics here. <laughs> but if you look at the back of the mirror here, you can see that it's green glass. This is like wine bottle glass. This is plate glass. This is not what you, is used anymore. And originally, this was a problem because the mirrors were silvered, not aluminized. And the silvering was a process that made the mirror shiny, made the glass shiny. It worked fine, except it it absorbed a lot of the infrared radiation. 
And as a result of that, the mirrors would heat up and they would warp. So that heat was a very big problem then. Now we use aluminum and that works out a little bit better. Now, you can see these old structures here. Also, for example, this, as we get towards, oh, a little bit later here, we're gonna have to probably move the mirror over because in the morning, light's coming from this direction. The afternoon, when we get towards the middle of the day, this secondary mirror is going to be blocking the light from the sun getting down to the first one. So it has to be moved over for that. The, this other mirror has a back and forth that adjusts it for latitude during different parts of the year with the sun at different elevations. The way all of these things move is with things like this, cranks. Crank on here as well. Now some of them do have motors and we'll show you how those work from, from down below but we just simply crank them back and forth. So no electronics here. As I said, all original. We have some DC motors, and when we push the brass buttons down below, these mirrors will turn. So we'll take a look at that as well. Now one last thing we just have to show you is on the other side here. I'll cross over here, and maybe we can get a camera on all this mechanism here. Now, this mechanism that's spinning here, can you get in that? Okay, and this is the clock drive. This is the original uh, governor. There is a falling weight that pulls this, uh, and it's just like clockwork. It's exactly what it is. And this is what rotates this first mirror to track the sun and uh, keep it in the second mirror so that it's always in the telescope. And you can see, even some of the gears that are that are moving as a result of that and here just I'm gonna stick my finger right in the shot here to show this part of it this is a transmission here this slides in and out and these gears here that are moving slowly those can be changed in order to have different rates so right now we're using the one that's marked solar but if we want to speed it up so that we can uh, use the um, track the uh, the stars, or slow it down to track the moon because the sun and the moon move in the sky, but the stars do not, there are other transmissions that can go in there. We've got some of those down below. We'll take a look at those. But this telescope was used for stellar work quite a bit in the early days because they had spectrographs that were bigger than any other telescope, even the world's biggest. So this was used for some of the early work on red giant stars, for example, showing that red giant stars were, were uh, cooler than the sun. And that was done by showing that the spectrum coming from the uh, red giant stars was similar to the spectrum of sunspots, which we, they already knew uh, 100 years ago were were cooler than the rest of the surface of the sun. But they didn't have the dispersion, the power of the instruments on the world's biggest telescopes. The instruments here don't have to swing around on the end of the telescope, just like the telescope itself. So that allowed them to make even bigger ones. And we're gonna take a look at the biggest one in here that's uh, been used for quite a while here as well. So let's travel back and hope we we do get some sunlight here to be able to show the spectrum. Now, this, um, which it wasn't even planned, but behind this safety panel here are some DC relays. And you can see in here that these, these are very old looking things. And uh, we want to show you what happens when we use those. We'll get a shot of those in just a little bit. Sorry, I'm moving around. And uh, so we'll get a shot of those when we get down here and start moving the telescope itself. Ah, and Tom. Let me introduce another one of the snow people with the snow telescope. Tom Meneghini 
who does everything up here. He runs the 60-inch telescope. He helps run the snow telescope. He uh, it clean, it cleans up. Uh, you just do just about everything, don't you, Tom? All purpose, thank you. <laughs> and how long have you been hanging out up here? 12 years. 12 years. So one of the newcomers. Yeah, yeah. relatively. <laughs> OK, so let's take a look at what happens now. If we can see behind that grate, when we click on one of these buttons, this is the old original panel and uh, or paddle and works the same as it did uh, it did back then it just needs a little bit of maintenance now and then so that sound is what what happens when these go these are mechanical relays done with high voltage dc which is why it's behind a protective panel So it's a noisy place when we work here. So I'll, I'll pass that off to you and we can, if we get some more sunlight out there, we can go out and take a look at what, what happens there. Okay, back down on the main level here. So this is the business end. This is where everything happens. This is the head of the spectrograph. The spectrograph itself is down below, 18 feet down in a 30 foot pit. But as I showed before, and let's see if we've got a little bit more light now so we can see the solar image. Again, this is going to get really bright here. Okay, so we have the image. I've lost track of, no, the sunspot is still there. And if I move this, you'll be able to see the solar image stays put. And then there's a faint sunspot right here. Not as much of a display as I've seen recently. Now we want to take a look down in the pit and see what actually happens. So we're going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to show you a view here, what it looks like from here. And then we're going to actually go down in there and take a close-up look. So, Ray, if you can give us a shot here, down like you did before. And here you can see that the light is coming down onto the main lens of the spectrograph. This is called a litro spectrograph. And that means that the light is going through it down to the grating and then back up through the lens again. And so we're getting uh, lots of colors, light coming off of that. Now, this is not the focus spectrum itself. We'll show you that, but we're going to do that with a camera, uh, specially designed for that. Now that's what's coming out here, but I want to point out as well Right here, this is the slit of the spectrograph. Now this slit here, actually, uh, there's a very, very, very thin opening in here. We adjust very finely. And so what the spectrograph is seeing is a tiny little rectangle of the sun. Just whatever light goes through that. That's it. And so that way we can look in careful detail at one small part. But it also is the reason that we get the lines that are so important. Now, up here on the wall, we have an example. For example, this uh, of a solar spectrum. And this is what cable is going through it. And this is what we uh, see. And this is what we're looking for, but in much, much finer detail. So that little slit there, that tiny little image, this is like many images of the sun, but in different colors. And where there are certain chemicals, the sun, sunlight is taken out. And we know what they are from checking against what we see in the, in the uh, chemistry labs. We're going to focus on this one, D, sodium D line, very bright one, a very common used one. So that is sodium in the Earth's atmosphere that causes that to disappear. And it's these lines that we're really looking for when we do something on the sun. 
So I guess we're ready to descend down into the pit. And so, um, can we use the lab? Okay. All righty. Yeah, I think I'll do that so I don't have to carry it. Okay. Little improvisation. I'm not usually wired for sound as I go down in here. Okay. And waiting for us here, of course, is a gremlin that lives in the pit. Our other cameraman, Steve, who's the one that had to get stuck with this duty. So we're now 18 feet down below, and there's still, there's still room to go in this pit, but this is where we're lined up. So this lens here, it's a six inch lens, and this lens is what focuses on that slit. Let's think of it as a big camera. We're looking at the image of that, of that slit. So we've got a, we form an image of the sun, but it's tiny little slit shaped. And down below it, here, is the grating itself. Now it doesn't look like much. You can see an area that's sort of square, it looks a little bit different, and you see the sun's image on there. But what is different in that square area, oh, and you can see some of the colors come up, coming off of it as well, that sort of different looking area has etches, little grooves, cut into the mirror. And those are 600 of those in each millimeter. So they're extremely fine, microscopic. Done, uh, it's a very special instrument that does this. And this is what spreads the light out like a prism into the spectrum. It goes back through this lens again and brings it back up to the top where it is focused at a certain point and then our camera can take a look. So the reason that it's this long is that it will spread out the light more. So the, the, more it, the longer it is, the more it will spread it out. There are other ways of getting to even other parts of the spectrum that are wider. We won't talk about here, but uh, this gives it really great power. Also makes it, uh, and, and as far as being down in the pit, this is for temperature control. It's always the same here. When it's summertime up here, it's very cool down here. Uh, in the, in the wintertime, it's a little bit more comfortable. Okay, so I'm going to head back up now, back into the sunlight. Okay. Grab my hand mic again. And uh, once we have everyone out of the pit, we'll set up the spectrograph to take a look. Now, the spectrograph is cool just looking at the light. I mean, it's wonderful, and you can see the lines with a little loop. But we can't do anything scientifically with it. For that, we need a camera. And I'm going to grab something here. This is what takes both hands for this. OK. Fitting right into there. This is a plate holder. This would be the back of a camera. You have the light coming up. It's focused by the big lens. You would take a glass plate, this shape, 
special type of emulsion, sort of special film, and you'd set it in there. And you would pull the dark slide. So this is the shutter. And that's it. Then you would take this, go on the other side of the wall here into the dark room, develop it, and find out what you got. So at this point is where we change from the old era to the new, because nobody wants to do it that way anymore. So everything on this telescope is original up to this point. But instead of the glass plates, or even film, which we used for a while for some educational things, we have a an actual CCD camera we use. There, locked in light tight. Later. Okay, let's get this one out of the way. Okay, and I think I'll go on the lava. I'm using my hands too much here. Thank you. Okay. Now this is somewhat makeshift because this telescope was not designed for CCD use, having been built 110 years ago. But this is some of the great work of the volunteers up here, specifically Bill Leflang, who is retired from a career building spacecraft at JPL, and John Hoot, who wrote the software and provided the little camera. Okay, and there on, the, there on our monitor, is part of the spectrum. It's a very, very small part of it, and we'll give you an idea how small a part that is. Now, first of all, people will look at it and say, where are the colors? Well, there they are. So this is a color image of the spectrum up here that we couldn't quite focus on and I'm not quite sure why we have this round thing here. Now, remember up here on the, we usually look at it in mono, so there we are. And it looks like we still have clouds because it's dimmed down quite a bit. So let me try and increase the exposure. And let's overexpose. Okay, and we have this odd thing here that got introduced while we were doing something here. So we can control the camera moving back and forth from this point, except not at the moment because it got turned off. Okay, there we go. So you can see the lines moving. So these two dark lines here, pretty, pretty hazy now because of the, uh, the clouds that we're having. Let me tighten that up a little bit. Yeah, it's better, but I don't know what that weird thing is there. Okay. Those two lines there, and let's get, go back to our wall map of the spectrum. Ah, uh, one other thing we need to do, that's what the, Close the pit. Um, is this a power cord going in? Can we disconnect it? Okay. If you can get that, we'll be able to close it up, get a better image. So I'll show here. Remember I mentioned the D lines. These two lines, out of this whole spectrum from blue to red, this is all that we're able to see in that one little piece. So the actual spectrum is way bigger than we can see even through that whole area. So this is very, very much magnified. I 
let's just close it up then. Close it on top. Pull it over the, the, that side if you can. Yeah. <laughs> or you can go down there and stay in there. That'll, that'll do. Okay, let's see if that improves it now. Okay, now we're... There we are. That's a bit of an improvement. Oh, yeah, much better. So these are these two D lines. There's a magnesium line and nickel lines in between. So from all of this, this is like taking the fingerprint of the sun, the sun's atmosphere. This is as the light comes through from the middle of the sun, eventually as it escapes through the part that we can see, it looks like a solid surface. It's really just gas. These are elements that exist there. And those elements are absorbing some of the light. So this is the way we get the information about what the sun is made of and even other stars. In the 1890s, one of the most prominent astronomers of the day, Simon Newcomb, said that we, we were approaching the limit of all that could be known about astronomy. But it was George Ellery Hale and others George Ellery Hale, the founder of this observatory, who came here to set up something to study the sun with special instruments, knowing that this coating was like the DNA of the stars. And the sun has the, it being the closest one, is the one we can study in the most detail. So the 60-inch telescope was set up to study the nighttime stars, and these telescopes, this, first the snow, and then the two solar telescopes to, in order to uh, uh, see what the stars were like and to compare the two, and a laboratory to test these things out. So these, these occur at a particular temperature, a particular pressure, and when you look at different levels, at different elements, you can learn more things at those levels. More than we can go into right here, but this is the trick. This is what does it. And those who are uh, amateur astronomers use H-alpha telescopes, hydrogen alpha, looking at one particular line that comes from a little bit higher area that shows all kinds of detail that we don't see in the white light we ordinarily look at with our eyes. So we do have the ability to scan back and forth here, but it's, and it looks like we're getting a little bit more sunlight. Maybe we'll be able to do more with this. Okay, so many fainter lines in there as well. And let me just scan a little bit, and I'll show you that as we go away from these lines, these are nice because they're very dark, they're very prominent, but as we move away from them, and we'll go through and just stop so we can catch a, a glimpse. And there are lines in here, fainter lines, still having a little bit of trouble because of the clouds. So they're all over the place. And they all signify some chemical in the sun's atmosphere, uh, as well as a few of them that are caused by the Earth's atmosphere because the light has to come through that as well. But we, we recognize which ones are which. Now, one thing I want to mention also, this is a very complex instrument. We have the optics down below there, we have the optics up here, and it all centers around that one little slit there. And these instruments, very long focus, have to be perfectly in line with each other. We've had various problems with this, but in fact, we had an expert come up and help us out, and it's now much better aligned than it was before. I wanna show you the type of equipment that is used for this. This is a special custom build and it's all done with lasers now and again this was all historic stuff it's all brass and so on these lasers used here for alignment are certainly not original stuff so uh, this was done by David Ho of Hotec and David has been a good uh, friend of Mount Wilson Observatory 
and uh, develop this specifically to um, uh, align all the components of this telescope and the spectrograph. And it's the first time I've seen it that well tuned up. David also, in order to sponsor this, has donated one of his popular products, which is a collimator for schmidt cassegrain uh, telescopes that amateurs use and we're going to be selling this is fundraising for astronomers without borders hope that people will go to our store and see that and hopefully purchase that collimator or other items uh, as part of this because doing these things are are not free in all the other programs that we do so David has thankfully um, sponsored this also, I'd like to mention, of course, Mount Wilson Observatory is the primary sponsor for this uh, program. And I'm going to show some of the other things about Mount Wilson as well. And we are also being carried on CosmoQuest. CosmoQuest is right now holding a hangout-a-thon. They are uh, having a 36-hour fundraising event. And that event is to raise funds for the pro programs that they do in citizen science and in education. They're a nonprofit. They're having more trouble now with the uh, funding from NASA and NSF having gone away. And uh, so once this is over, I hope everybody will tune into CosmoQuest and help support them too. CosmoQuest is a partner of Astronomers Without Borders, and we do many different programs together. So uh, do check out CosmoQuest dot com or org, it'll be one or the other, but you should see them on our, our Google Plus channel as well when you're watching this. So uh, that's very important as well. Now we have some pictures from the history of this telescope that I'd like to show you. And in the rush here, well first, you know, let's, let's take a scan at our control center here. We have two cameras and a crew controlling everything to be able to bring this to you in high def and to archive it. So we have audio and video controls. There's Mike on audio back there. Liam, the producer, and Armin right here, who's controlling the camera uh, video feeds. And now we even have a shot of the cameras uh, pointing at each other. So you can see Ray and Martin as well. And uh, Linda, who's doing craft services, hidden in a corner someplace. So we're going to have to do this a little bit off the cuff. So, uh, Liam, let's take a look at the images that I gave you. We just ran out of time getting this set up, so we're going to do this like any old-fashioned uh, uh, slideshow. What do you got here? Let me get my glasses. Okay. There's a funny transition. Okay, just start bringing them up from the beginning and we'll see what we In 1970, just talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, this is what happens with live webcasts in remote locations. I want to mention something else too about uh, Mount Wilson Observatory, and that is that the observatory is open to the public from, during the warm season from uh, April through. November, I believe, mountwilson.edu is the website. One of the most important things, and we want to show you some of that, is the ability to use the 60-inch telescope. The 60-inch telescope is one of the, it was the first nighttime telescope put here. It was still considered part of Mount Wilson's solar observatory because it was so important to have uh, telescopes looking at the, the stars as well, in addition to the sun. The 60-inch was the largest telescope in the world by quite a bit, and it did really groundbreaking historic work. And uh, I have setup going on all around me here. <laughs> and so uh, that telescope is available for use. On mountwilson.edu, you can learn how you can actually come up and be a part of a, an observing session or actually just rent the telescope for yourself. We can have up to 25.
own event, I think that's absolutely unique. And it's available every night of the year, um, every night of the warm season, beginning in April. So it is available right now. The planets, the dark sky objects are unbelievable through that. And you ha do we have it? We do. We can switch to, we'll just switch to this. So just that's, over this. That's, that's fine. fine. Okay. So I wanted to be able to show you some of the ways in which this historic telescope got up here. And this, believe it or not. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> this is transportation. This is the transportation that we used. Uh, well, I don't want to say we, because I was not here at this time. This is over 100 years ago. This is the way these things came up the mountain. And these are the, uh, the uh, mules and the uh, very colorful people who used them. And that's, so this will be sort of a slide show. So Liam, go on to the next one here. This is actually a part of the snow spectrograph. So that is something that went into this telescope. Here you can see that rather odd looking uh, vehicle that they're using. Uh, it's being steered at the front and steered at the rear. It's only two feet wide because this was a nine and a half foot long mountain trail. It was very treacherous and nothing bigger could make it up here. And in the next is the snow telescope itself. Uh, coming into shape. This is the tall pier that we were standing on when we were looking at the uh, spectra, the Celestat mirrors there. And let's see, this is, a, this is a surprise for me in every slide. Let's see what we have. The Celestat mirrors as they were, the, the building at the time was covered with canvas rather than the metal that we have now. And this is an example of the spectrum way better than what we're looking at here. You noticed a lot of spots that we had in the, on the uh, image of the, the spectrum there, and those were simply dust on various elements that hasn't been cleaned off. <clears throat> but those lines going across from right to left are actually caused by the sunspot that you see on the left-hand side. And that dark line running through it, that is the slit. That's what's causing those lines. And the one that takes a fork in the middle there is proof that there is a magnetic field in this very strong spot. It was here with the 60-foot tower right next to us that Hale was able to show for the first time that a magnetic field existed off of the Earth, and that was uh, on the sun. Okay. This is another, this is more advanced transportation here. This, uh, the engineers get upset if I call it a hybrid, but it's a mix. This vehicle steers front and back as well, you can see somebody standing back there. It actually has a, an internal combustion engine, but that runs a generator that feeds electricity to uh, motors at each one of the four wheels. So this was a very early type of car to get up this road. It now been widened up to about eight feet. So it's an electric vehicle with its own uh, generator on it. And uh, Here's an early picture of the snow telescope. The shed, in this case, everything covered with canvas, is in the closed position. So the mirrors are not visible. And with it in the open position, this is how it was today when we were out there except for the, uh, the, the metal over everything instead of the canvas. And a similar one, so move on to, well, there's that, that vehicle again being pulled by a horse, and it, it looks like it should be pretty secure there. I think the next one shows that things do happen. Yes, once in a while, he couldn't even make it with this thing only two feet wide getting around one of those turns. All of the power up here at the time was DC. It's high voltage DC in here, except for the AC that has been added in order to be able to run computers and, and other things. So all this equipment you see here is not at running off a of high voltage DC, thankfully. But this, was, these are, uh, this is a generator that generated power for the entire mountain. That generator is still there and it has been brought back into operating uh, function by a couple of uh, engine, uh, old engine uh, hobbyists and is used uh, sometimes for demonstrations as well. 
There were earlier solar telescopes, but these were only temporary. This is something like the Snow Telescope, and the next one, I think, shows a little close-up of it. Yes, there's Hale himself taking a look through the eyepiece. So this is the way things worked back then. And Liam, I think if we get uh, those other two, about the 60 inch, as long as we're here looking over your shoulder, the ones we were not in that folder. Exactly. Oh, great. What did you do? <laughs> Okay, here, here was the 60-inch telescope. Here is the 60-inch telescope. Now, this is with a class. This is a program that happens here, Curia. It's a summer program for mostly undergraduates. And we use this telescope in order to look at the sky. The snow telescope here is a primary instrument for solar. The 60-inch telescope is used a little bit. And, and the one other picture that we have there, you can see an overall view of it. And that one there, and you can blow it up a little bit, and we have myself modeling with it. So there we have the 60-inch telescope in the dome. And this is where, for a quite reasonable amount, you can bring a whole party up and spend the evening looking through one of the world's largest telescopes that's fitted for visual observing and available for everyone. So uh, that's on a regular basis. So uh, I highly recommend taking a look at that. Um, timing. So we start a little bit late, and so we're going to end a little bit late because there is always more to do. So let's head back over to the main part of this. Also, one of our plans was to take questions and in the midst of everything, and you notice we got started a little bit late as well, um, the, the ability to have one of these people following the feed for questions, no harm done there, uh, following the feed for questions was lost. But if you ask questions on that, and uh, I don't know if it's possible to still do it there, but if you tweet them to AWB underscore ORG, which is Astronomers Without Borders, then uh, we will answer them. I'll answer them for you. You can even tweet me directly at uh, Mike AWB, M I K E A W B. If you tweet me, I will answer them. We should have a hashtag or something on that. Liam, did we ever set up a hashtag? No, apparently not. We'll figure out a way. We will announce it. So if you look, check our Google channel our Facebook page, or anything else. And I do have to say something, uh, not only about the great support from Mount Wilson Observatory and allowing us to bring this on, internet, on Sunday with, during Global Astronomy Month, which is now the organization that brings this whole thing to you is Astronomers Without Borders. Astronomers Without Borders. And we do programs all over the world. These programs are accessible to everyone. We have a huge community of astronomy enthusiasts. We would like it right now during your fundraising, the fundraising drive if you would support CosmoQuest during their 36-hour Hangout-a-thon. And if you're not viewing it there, look for CosmoQuest. They're easy to find and help them out. At the same time, please check our website at astronomerswithoutborders.org and uh, see what it is that we do and support us as well. And we will be having our own fundraising drive coming up soon. But Global Astronomy Month, the world's largest annual celebration of astronomy, will be ending uh, it on April 30th. It's been fabulously successful. Look for more results, pictures from around the world, and more following up after that. So from here, in the snow telescope, just one of the few places that you can actually see inside how things actually work and how solar telescopes really work. Uh, we're going to wrap this up this time, but I hope we'll be able to do more. We do have uh, Hangouts uh, webcasts involving different kinds of programs. 
special places, things you don't ordinarily see, combination of astronomy and uh, art, which is very common. And just a couple days ago, we had a hangout including sidewalk astronomers from across the Western Hemisphere uh, in South America and North America. And this is what it's about, Astronomers Without Borders. Our motto is one people, one sky. And when we see the sky from different places, we do the same thing. We're all practicing the same thing. And it transcends the borders that we put in place that are political, geographic, cultural, and everything else. So from Mount Wilson Observatory, I'd like to say thank you for joining us now. This will be available as well. Watch for the recording. And please let others know about it so they can see it as well. Share it on Facebook, Twitter, wherever else you have. But please do come and see us at Astronomers Without Borders and see what we have going. And uh, hopefully you'll become a supporter, but at least become a participant. So thank you all for coming from Mount Wilson Observatory.